Good morning. My name is Timothy Walker. I am a researcher here at the Institute for Security Studies in the Peace Operations and Peace Building Division. I've recently returned from Lome in Togo, where the African Union Extraordinary Summit on Maritime Security, Safety, Development and Governance occurred from the 10th to the 15th of October. And uh, today I'll be discussing what occurred, uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Charter, and also some of the ways forward. And I'm looking forward to engaging in conversation as well with uh, with participants. Um, so uh, I'll give a brief presentation and we'll proceed from there. First thing, uh, given my previous presentation about a month ago before the summit was uh, some questions over whether the Lomé summit would occur. It did occur. Very pleased to say that uh, we can count that as a, a bit of a milestone along the way of uh, creating or enhancing African maritime security and development and governance. In, in the continent. Um, previous postponements were attributed to uh, logistical problems. Uh, in Lomé itself, there was a lot of uh, banners and uh, very visible street presence of the, of the summit taking place. So there was a lot of investment in this one occurring. So on that level, it seemed it had to occur. There were a few other um, political issues along the way which might have derailed it, which I'll get into. But uh, overall, I think uh, we can see that uh, with a very healthy attendance, there were 52 um, uh, attending uh, uh, delegations, uh, 17 heads of state. That's a, that's a pretty significant uh, sign that uh, maritime is being treated as a, a priority by a, at an extraordinary summit as well, that maritime is going to receive a lot of attention. Uh, going forward. Um, so it's, 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 it's a good sign in that regard. Uh, 31 signatories, um, 30 uh, according to um, the United Nations criteria because the, uh, the uh, Western Sahara was also a signatory but uh, it's a member of the AU but not of the UN. But uh, there were some significant non-signatories as well which I'll discuss later on. Um, also we do have PDFs of the Lomé Charter please do um, email us if you'd like to have uh, some sent along. They're also in French, Arabic, and Portuguese as well. The, um, say the fact that this summit took place at effectively the highest level uh, for the continent was very significant and had significant member state um, buy-in and participation. Uh, the onus is now on those member states to now go back and uh, proceed or carry on with their existing maritime uh, policies, governance, uh, actions, etc., and uh, and see how they make sure that they align increasingly with the charter, with the existing strategies as well, such as the African Integrated Maritime Strategy, and also Agenda 2063. We might need to uh, take note and uh, bear in mind that there are a lot of existing uh, maritime strategies, uh, codes, and conventions. Uh, in play at the moment. Lomé is uh, but one of them. It's not taking over as the most important one. Lomé effectively will give uh, more, um, more impetus to states to implement, to design as well as implement uh, maritime related policies in the future. Uh, the, the potential is there to protect and uh, enable the conditions for uh, not just security but development as well. Uh, when I've been referring to the security role of the or the security function of the Charter, um, it does entail certain articles which will create cooperation, um, create amongst states the realization that it's better to cooperate in terms of information sharing, to uh, create kind of joint centers, for instance, uh, but also enable at national level the conditions for um, development, uh, economic inducements, and uh, a conducive environment to uh, create or ben benefit from increased maritime industries, shipbuilding, fishing, tourism, to name a few. Um, now that's already going on. The Lomé hasn't, for instance, kick-started these into process. These are very long, uh, long-standing with a long history uh, processes. For instance, Africa had shipping lines in the past. There's a, there's, in, since the 1980s, there's been a reduction in the number of uh, shipping lines that are African-owned or African-owned ships, apart from one or two countries, such as Liberia, for instance. 
Um, so the uh, the way forward is to uh, make sure that national level there is more um, benefit, um, should we say, more priority given to maritime focused activities, but also at national level more coordination to ensure that ultimately a, a more higher level concept of the blue economy uh, uh, it's translated into um, real benefits, an increase in GDP, for instance, because there are new industries, uh, an uh, increased workforce, uh, uh, maritime related as well. But like I said, we can get into the well, crucial point to make is that a common uh, nature to everything is going to effectively be enhanced here. There's a common realization of common problems, common solutions, and at a national level as well, that there needs to be a more comprehensive but coordinated uh, way forward for maritime policy. Um, effectively, because no state can do everything by itself. Um, states will have within their sovereign borders and, and according to their own uh, interests and policies, the creation of various activities. For instance, a, a country like Togo or a small maritime country is not going to prioritize building a navy, whereas a, a country which uh, has uh, shipping lines in the future will prioritize perhaps uh, the creation of a, a navy or uh, the ability to protect its maritime domain because um, that, that deri it derives a lot of wealth from that. Um, one point I'd like to stress is that the, uh, the enhanced measures envisioned are a bit vague. They, there's no need to effectively reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lot of potential institutions, a lot of potential organizations have already been proposed. Uh, for instance, in the in the 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy. Now, the Lomé Charter uh, doesn't mention those specifically. In previous drafts, it did mention them. I'll give some examples coming up. But um, there is a there's a realization I think that needs to perhaps should we say a a better realization that uh, there's a lot of initiatives and institutions uh, nascent, uh, inchoate, uh, coming forth which uh, we need to encourage now as well at national, but also continental level too. Uh, Cross-sector, multi-level, it's an um, ambitious document, as all maritime documents have been. Um, the AU will play a very big role in terms of coordination. It will host the secretariat envisioned for the, uh, the state parties to the Lomé Charter in the future. And also um, uh, have a, a monitoring function as well, reports, for instance, uh, of state parties in terms of uh, their success in their implementation. The, um, the speech at the fifth, on the 15th was uh, by the chairperson in Costa Sana Limini Zuma was, uh, I found, very progressive. It um, highlighted and emphasized the important role of women in the blue economy and maritime security in the future. Uh, not just at an entrepreneurial level, but at all levels, and uh, not just in terms of economics, but security as well. It also, interestingly, did not mention piracy once. Now, piracy is a major problem, uh, has been a major problem, could still be a major problem in the future if, uh, if conditions change. But the fact that uh, the focus was more on development, it was more on the kind of governance uh, requirements, and also some suggestions, for instance, in terms of um, creation of African shipping, uh, emphasis on creating a skilled, trained, uh, large workforce of uh, seafarers and maritime uh, ex uh, development of expertise in the future was very progressive. So I was very, I was very pleased to note that. Uh, the charter itself, the document that was eventually signed, is, uh, is largely watered down, as most uh, international documents uh, tend to be the kind of uh, obligatory language uh, is not there uh, for reasons of concern over potentially the impingement on sovereignty. So um, there are there were the removal of, as I said earlier, some key institutions which could have featured. Um, the AIMS strategy, for instance, uh, envisions having a, what's called an MIC2, a Maritime Information Coordination Center uh, this is something at some side events which was uh, noted in terms of the importance at the AU level of having a, uh, an information portal or an information um, centre and uh, outputs. Now, this is something that's been proposed. It was previously in the Lomé Charter. It's now subsequently been removed uh, in favour of more just uh, general um, uh, states will endeavour to create systems. So there are some systems already envisioned. 
Um, so uh, it'd be good to see potentially if that will be resuscitated. Uh, there's also a lack of reference to uh, existing regional or international institutions in the Charter. Uh, a major one at the regional levels, sub-regional levels, is the Yuande Code of Conduct and the Djibouti Code of Conduct. Um, now those aren't, um, well the Djibouti Code of Conduct is not specifically targeted at Africa, it is a Western Indian Ocean initiative. But the fact that uh, these don't appear in the Charter raises some questions about whether they will be uh, continually encouraged or whether member states continue to see them as a, a useful way forward. Um, there's an initiative in Southern Africa called the Benguela Current Commission as well, which is a, an interesting uh, and potentially uh, innovative way forward in terms of thinking about what we need to protect and also the best way of creating international cooperation. I'm here talking here between South Africa, Namibia and Angola. Um, obviously to create in the the preamble of a charter, every initiative would be um, quite exhaustive. But uh, but to uh, to target a few important ones like that would have been better uh, highlighted. And um, environmentally as well, an important initiative which has been neglected is the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, specifically number 14, which talks about ocean conservation. Now that does not feature the, um, the process of creating um, development goals at the UN is noted but it is not developed, it does not feature later on in the other articles. Um, again, that's a, that's a major problem because um, it's, uh, all states have uh, committed at the UN level to this kind of uh, development goal, so to see it feature there would have been very important as a, uh, a reminder. Um, most things will have gone to the annexures. Now these annexures haven't been, or annexes haven't been included uh, in the final charter which has been uh, released or is available uh, because they still need to be developed. A lot of things will be uh, move, have been moved to the annexes. So states, for instance, have signed in principle and uh, the follow-on process now of creating those annexes will result in potentially uh, more meetings, more, um, more discussions on, uh, on the nature of some key concepts, for instance. What a blue economy is, it's a major issue which um, does not feature as well as it could in the Charter. The Charter doesn't, for instance, spell out the pathway to a blue economy or, or really um, create the kind of a clear idea of what is required to create blue economies at national and, and also a, a coordinative um, level as well. For instance, blue economies where um, there are transnational fishing so, uh, resources which are going to be tapped or protected um, that needs to feature more as well. So that's something which features at a, a national level. But uh, going forward, it would be helpful to have that uh, quickly created and, uh, and included too. Uh, definitions, uh, I, found, I find them to be a little, a little weak and a little uh, inadequate at times. But funnily enough, the, the definition section of the Charter has increased from two pages to five pages, going to show just how many states and stakeholders um, for how long we've been discussing maritime security and blue economy in a, a perhaps at a, a more abstract level and to actually pinpoint the real needs for what is required or what everyone believes to be uh, falls under the tag of illegal fishing for instance um, is, is an important thing uh, which uh, it features there but uh, there are many other things as well for instance the definition of maritime security um, which is, uh, let me just find it quick uh, focuses on the uh, prevention and fight against all acts and threats of illicit acts against a uh, ship, its crew and its passengers or against port facilities and infrastructure and, and the environment. Um, the kind of definition of maritime security going forward which I started off this presentation and also which uh, I think is, is most beneficial is, uh, is one that not just protects against threats but also creates enabling uh, conditions and not just for states to have security but at a, at a sub-state level and a community level as well, is to make sure that those who take to the sea, uh, who wish to derive benefit or a livelihood from maritime related activities, are, uh, are enabled as well as protected against threats, whether they come from um, within a country or externally as well. Um, so LOME is not particularly human security focused, as again, we can understand that because it is a, a charter for states to go to go home and, and implement activities and create activities. But it would be have been good to have seen those included there. The fact that they're not included, 
I think is a, a good point for a point of departure for discussion. Um, the, um, the development aspect of the charter is a, bit, uh, is a bit weak as well. There are 11 articles dedicated under a development section, but um, they are not well developed, shall we say. Governance as well is, is, is rather weak. Um, it talks of some initiatives such as, um, which we don't, which, which we see elsewhere uh, in greater detail as well. So when I mentioned earlier about reinventing the wheel, it would have been good to have seen more reference made there. Security is, uh, is obviously the feature. It's the most developed in terms of its articles, but it's also one which is sprinkled throughout it um, in the creation of, for instance, uh, coordination centers, information sharing, what is important to fight against, piracy, um, trafficking, for instance. Those are, those are featured, but um, in terms of how they relate to one another, that still needs to be developed. Um, the notable non-signatories as well uh, are, are interesting. South Africa, for instance, is not a signatory. Uh, Ethiopia, um, not necessarily you would think a maritime um, country, but a very important African role player and has a shipping uh, line of its own. It's not a, a, a signatory. Cameroon, very important regional maritime actor, is not a signatory. And also Mauritius, as a, an island state with a blue economy, is not a, is not a signatory. Now, um, each will have its own, I'm sure, reasons, national interests, which uh, we need to now tease out and understand why they chose not to sign this particular charter, which, as I say, is, um, is not as strong as it once was. So obviously a lot of concerns have been taken into account in the drafting and the final language. Um, uh, but m most of these states were in attendance and we need to see whether they will sign in the future. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a good cause for discussion there as well. Some, for instance, already have their own blue economy initiatives, which they would wish to perhaps uh, continue at their own national level rather than um, see uh, coordinated or um, regulated at a, at a higher level there. Um, one notable absentee from the proceedings was the um, Southern African Development uh, Community, or SADAC, who did not have a table at the summit and uh, who may have had a, a, a few representatives there, but only four Southern African development uh, countries signed. Uh, they were um, Madagascar, the Seychelles, Tanzania, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, going forward, all states who have participated are going to have more of a maritime interest. As, as I said, there was a lot of participation. At regional level, they would like to uh, better coordinate and have common policies and at the overall continental level having a coordination to ensure that all strategies are aligned is uh, is going to be very important but the, like I say that requires everyone to participate um, not just states but uh, the regional uh, mechanisms as well and uh, that would be something very important to see uh, going forward otherwise we'll see um, certain regions and potentially states falling behind or developing their own activities um, which are in accordance, should we say, are aligned with the strategy, uh, the strategies of the AU and also the co this uh, charter, but aren't in specific reference to it. Um, there are other maritime mechanisms as well, which uh, have received some mention, but are also important now to take forward as well. It could have been an opportunity to uh, reinitiate or, or uh, revitalize the um, the signing of the African or the revised African Maritime Transport Charter. Uh, at Chatham House in March, uh, I had the opportunity to speak to the um, the, uh, uh, the Togolese foreign minister, who was uh, the primary mover and uh, organizer for the uh, for, for this um, for this summit. And uh, I mentioned, for instance, that uh, there was only seven signatories for a, another charter, which was seen at the time as a very important initiative. So we need to make sure that we've received thirty-one, for instance, uh, an, an, an advocacy role we can play in the future. Is um, is to ensure that states uh, now uh, ratify and deposit the instruments uh, of ratification for this charter. Unlike, unlike, well, what should we say? Unlike what has occurred in the past, make sure that the transport charter and this Lomé charter are received because it doesn't come into force until the the charter is um, uh, the fifteenth signatory, um, the fifteenth deposit of the instrument of ratification occurs. Um, until that time, we are proceeding as we have 
with uh, with national, regional, and and continental maritime initiatives and policies. Um, and the charter will hopefully um, add to as a, a reinforcement mechanism, add extra impetus and legal force as it as it's supposed to. But uh, but until that time, we may have to wait a little while to see that uh, coming into play. The um, the AU. Uh, has, a, has an interesting path forward, an interesting set of policies and, uh, and uh, actors it needs to uh, empower now. Um, there's been a long talk of a Department of Maritime Affairs at the AU. Uh, considering the AU Commission is going to be the Secretariat for the Lomé Charter, it needs to make sure that uh, there is a dedicated maritime presence and uh, capacity at the AU now. Uh, member states um, are going to I think uh, as a way forward, for instance, at the ISS, is to review implementation of national maritime projects, but also how they align to these new charters and initiatives. Um, enabling, as I say, creating the enabling conditions now at member state level is, is crucial. The, um, the international mechanisms or potential uh, mechanisms are there. Uh, states have indicated a willingness and an interest in signing up to them. And uh, I'd like to see now, for instance, uh, that continuing into 2017 and beyond. Um, we have a, a responsibility as, as, for instance, researchers, but also people who are interested in the maritime domain to, um, to keep track of these developments, to, um, to, to uh, see um, how things are going in terms of the signing and the implementation of, of the charters. And uh, like I say, it's, uh, it's exciting exciting prospect in the future. The, um, the interest is there. Um, there is a continually growing uh, interest in blue economy and maritime security developments at national level. Let's make sure that those are um, coordinated and uh, occurring in terms of collaboration going forward.